Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be back here once again for the third time to give you another talk. <coughs> Everybody hear me okay at the back? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, the legacy of the Hubble Space Telescope. There are a few people, I think, that don't recognize, regardless of whether they're astronomers or even members of the general public, there are a few people who don't recognize the iconic telescope. And I wrote this talk a few years back, and I realized it was its 25th birthday at the time, but a few years have moved on, and now it's its 30th birthday since its launch. And as I will say shortly, when I give you a little bit of its history, it's actually somewhat older than that as well. So what I'm going to do is to give you a little bit of an introduction as to uh, why it was thought that we do need a space telescope and what are the ground-based alternatives, a little bit of the history about how it got to where it is, how the optics were flawed and how the optics were fixed, and a little bit about the legacy. So in other words, what has it done for us in terms of the science? What has it done for us in terms of touching the public consciousness? With only a short talk of only the two or three hours that I have this evening, I'm not going to be able to cover all of what the Hubble telescope has done for us. So it's going to be a very much reduced, let's just pick one or two scientific highlights and have a look at what the telescope has done. Because of course, after 30 years, it has been so productive, you can't possibly encapsulate it all. And then a little bit looking to the future, recapping future space telescopes and, again, do we need more space telescopes or is that it? Can we get away with ground-based telescopes from here on in? Here's a reminder of the sort of telescopes that are around at the moment, partly historical, a lot of it forward-looking. And this is a, a sort of a, a, a diagram of the relative sizes of the primary mirrors or the primary lens in the one and only case of a refracting telescope, right in the top left, the Yerkes one meter uh, um, lens there, the 40 inch refractor. So you can see, you can barely see it as a little blue dot in the top left hand corner. And that reminds you that there's an awful lot of telescopes with very large collecting areas, very large mirrors. The space telescopes I'm going to be talking about this time around are here in the bottom left. So in the bottom right of the red rectangle, we have the Hubble Space Telescope. To its left, we have the James Webb. I'll say a little more about that right at the end. And above James Webb and Hubble, we have Gaia and Kepler, two other space telescopes. You can either think of them as space telescopes or spacecraft, which happen to have mirrors and uh, uh, instrumentation on board. But you can see that all of these space telescopes are tiny compared to the very large ground-based telescopes, some of which already exist, the 100-inch Hooker, the 200-inch Hale telescope, uh, the Keck telescope, the Grand Telescopio Canarius in yellow in the top middle. That's the largest existing telescope, 10.4 meter diameter. But you can see there's many other telescopes on the right-hand side that are getting absolutely huge by comparison, including the large one on the right-hand side, the European Extremely Large Telescope, which ultimately will have a mirror OK, a segmented mirror, a mirror made of lots of small mirrors, but overall a mirror of about 40 meters in diameter. So if we are capable of generating very large telescopes on Earth, why do we bother with small telescopes in space? Let's just uh, start from the, the raison d'etre, if you like. So of course, telescopes have come a long way in 400 years or so, um, from the lenses uh, that led up to the Yerkes, um, and then basically switching over to mirrors because lenses really can't be made above about a meter or so in diameter because the lens would need to be supported, otherwise the lens would sag. So after about a meter in diameter, lenses became impractical, mirrors took over. And of course, there's always a drive for always bigger, bigger objectives. If we can collect more light with a large mirror, we can collect more light so we can see fainter objects. That's one advantage of having large um, collecting mirrors, but also if we have a large mirror, then we have a higher resolution. In other words, we can either see more detail in smaller objects, or we can see those same objects at greater distances. So by going to larger mirrors, we have a double whammy. We collect more light, we have better resolution, so we see fainter objects, and we see uh, more detail in existing objects. So if there's always this drive for going for larger mirrors, why are we putting such a tiny little space telescope up in, uh, in the form of the Hubble Space Telescope? 
The Hale, meter, the Hale telescope, for instance, was a, a solid slab of glass, the 200 inch or 5 meter diameter. These days, it's much more likely that we build telescopes using segmented mirrors, where we have hexagonal segments about 2 meters or so in diameter and make up a larger mirror. But both of these, remember, whether they be a solid piece of glass or a segmented mirror, they're both very large, even before we think of the forward look to 40 meter diameter mirrors rather than something of order 10 meters. The Hale is only, sorry, the Hubble is only half the size of the Hale mirror. The Hubble mirror is about 2.4 meters. The Hale telescope was about 5 meters. So why do we bother putting such a small telescope up into orbit? Yes, we're going to be limited by the amount of light we can collect and the amount of detail we can see by sticking with a small mirror, but if we can get above the Earth's atmosphere, we can get rid of the Earth's turbulent effect of looking through a turbulent atmosphere, a chaotically turbulent atmosphere, and hence we can start to see detail that we couldn't see with a similar sized telescope here on the Earth. By putting a telescope in orbit, you get above essentially 99.999% of the atmosphere. Technically, there's still a little bit of air up there, but a tiny amount. And hence, we can essentially get the full resolution that the telescope is able to give us, rather than being compromised or degraded by the Earth's atmosphere. So the 2.4 meter diameter of the Hubble Space Telescope is not that that's enough in the sense that we would always want to have a larger mirror to collect more light to give us more detail, but it was a very hard practical limit because the Hubble Space Telescope had to fit inside the cargo bay of the Space Shuttle. That was it. The Space Shuttle had already been basically on the drawing board. Even when the, uh, the Space Telescope was itself on the drawing board, they had an idea of how big it had to be because the Space Shuttle was already being designed. And the 10-ton Hubble is then limited by having notionally two and a half, actually 2.4 meter diameter mirror. The Hubble Space Telescope itself is a little bit bigger than that, but that what is what puts a constraint on the largest telescope that could be put into orbit to get us above the Earth's atmosphere. To give you an idea of what the Earth's atmosphere does, if you take the same size telescope as the Hubble, if you were to operate that telescope on Earth, even on the top of a very nice mountain uh, in the middle of nowhere, you would still find the resolution would be degraded by about a factor of 10 compared to what the Hubble can actually do sitting above the Earth's atmosphere. In other words, the Hubble Space Telescope would behave um, as if it was similar to a telescope of, uh, of only one-tenth the size or thereabouts. So let's start with a bit of history. Let's have a look at the timeline. Perhaps it started a little earlier than you think. 1970. 1970 was the first time NASA started to make plans for what at the time was called the Large Space Telescope. So basically, they hadn't even finished the Apollo moon landings. They had just achieved Apollo 11, but during uh, 1970, um, Apollo 12 has been done, Apollo 13 was on its way. They're already thinking about a Large Space Telescope. That was the first milestone. What do you think the second milestone for the Large Space Telescope was? It was cancelled. Okay, 1974, they pulled the funding and Congress said, too expensive, nice idea, NASA, but no, we really can't afford one of these things. They're going to be way too expensive. That produced uh, a lot of um, lobbying of senators on the, uh, on the part of scientists and astronomers, uh, a lot of letter writing. That's how serious it was. People actually started writing letters to their senators. And eventually, the Senate agreed to a reduced level of funding not quite the original amount that NASA said, this is how much it's going to cost to build a space telescope. Not quite the same as uh, HS2, but a very expensive, uh, a very expensive uh, funding campaign required here. Congress uh, said, yes, we will fund a large space telescope, but only if we can get somebody else to share the costs. And so basically, they got ESA on board. So you tend to think of the Hubble Space Telescope as being a NASA telescope, but strictly, it's a NASA slash ESA. It's American and European. NASA put in more money, so it tends to be thought of as an American uh, product, as it were, but strictly, it's both. So in 1978, Congress uh, basically agreed to the LST funding by agreement with ESA um, coming up with some of the cash. 
And at that point, they needed to put it out to tender. And although we think of the Hubble Space Telescope as a telescope, as far as NASA was concerned, it was a spacecraft. It was a spacecraft, and the spacecraft has to be constructed by somebody, and that contract went to Lockheed. Spacecraft means the outer shell and the power systems, the solar panels, and everything else that keeps it working, and the optics was given to a separate firm, Perkin Elmer. So Perkin Elmer basically made the mirrors. Lockheed made the infrastructure and the superstructure and the power systems and everything that was needed to make that telescope do its job effectively. So, two subcontractors for the, uh, for the project. 1979, construction of the primary mirror begins. In other words, Perkin Elmer were given the job, make a 2.4 meter diameter mirror, make it as good as you can. They started in the late 70s, um, and they uh, spent a couple of years um, making the figure of the mirror, polishing it, and then coating it with, uh, with aluminium. In 1981, some two years or so after the, that started, they declared that the polishing of the mirror was complete, and they tested it, and it was perfect, as close to perfect as their testing rig would tell them. So in other words, they basically said, everything is okie-dokie. Congress realized that if you're going to make a large space telescope, it's absolutely critical that the mirror does its job correctly. So when Congress agreed to the funding of the Large Space Telescope, they said, Perkin Elmer, make a mirror. But just in case something goes wrong with the mirror, because that's absolutely critical to the project, they asked a second company to make a backup. They basically told Kodak, go away, make a backup, and uh, just in case the Perkin Elmer one doesn't um, come to fruition, we'll have a second one that will be just as good. In 1981, because Perkin Elmer said, we've made the mirror, we've polished it, it's absolutely fantastic on the test we've done, no need for a backup. At that point, um, Kodak were told, forget it, um, thank you for making a backup, but we don't need it, and the Kodak mirror went into a museum at that point. Not long after, 1983, was basically the original planned launch date, early 80s. It was at this point, give or take a few months, that they decided this large space telescope ought to have a name, and that's the point at which they'd said, in honor of Edwin Hubble, we will call this the Hubble Space Telescope. So Edwin Hubble's contributions, I'm sure you know, using the Hooker Telescope in, in, uh, on Mount Wilson, and uh, looking at the expansion of the universe from the recession velocity of galaxies. So at that point, it became the Hubble Space Telescope. There were then a few slippages. 1984, it, um, things weren't quite ready. Perkin Elmer schedule slipped. 1985, Perkin Elmer and Lockheed had some problems, and there was a slippage there. But by 1986, pretty much everything was ready. Um, the budget at this point already hit a billion. I can't remember what the original proposal was in terms of how much money NASA asked for, but basically the Americans and the Europeans were coughing up about a billion dollars, and it had not leveled off yet. This is not including the cost of sending shuttles up to service it. This is just the cost up to this point. So it was ready for launch, but unfortunately, 1986, the Challenger disaster meant that the shuttle missions to take objects into orbit uh, was uh, put on hold, and it was some time later, there was uh, quite a few years before the investigation of the Challenger, and then there was a backlog of satellites to go back into orbit. The military had dibs on the ones they wanted to get up, and it wasn't until 1990 that the Hubble Space Telescope finally made it into orbit. So although we think of the Hubble Space Telescope at the moment as being 30 years old, remember it started in 1970. The project started in 1970. So you could think of it, if you wish, as the Hubble Space Telescope project is actually, is actually 50 years old. So finally, they got it launched in 1990. Total costs, as of this point, was somewhere in the region of two, two and a half billion or so, and that's about where it stood. And then you add on to that the cost of shuttle launches to maintain it, which are a few hundred million each, each time you go up. So not the cheapest of telescopes ever made, for sure. One point about the uh, design, which is important for what comes next. 
The design of the Hubble Space Telescope is called a Ritchie Crescent design. That might mean something to some of you, but basically it means that the main mirror is not a parabola. A parabola is the ideal shape for focusing uh, light from infinity to a point, but uh, it has some aberrations. It doesn't produce perfect star images over a wide angle. It produces a perfect star image for starlight that's hitting the mirror perpendicular to the mirror surface. So there's a different type of design called Ritchie Crescent. That's been around for quite a while, but it involves not a parabolic mirror, but a hyperbolic mirror. This is a slightly different shape. If you remember your school days of your conic sections, circles, ellipses, parabola, hyperbola, it's a slightly different shape. If you take a parabola and open it out slightly, you get a hyperbola. So the idea of using hyperbolic mirrors is you, in principle, can produce sharper star images over a nice wide field of view. Virtually all modern telescopes use Richard Creation design. However, the last one that didn't was the 200-inch, uh, 5-meter Hale telescope in Mount Palomar. That particular Leviathan used a parabolic mirror. The Richie Creation design was around at the time, but Hale um, didn't really get on with Ritchie, one of the uh, optical uh, engineers of the time. Um, and Hale decided not to be too avant-garde about it. He stuck with the tried and trust trusted parabola rather than move to the, to the hyperbolic mirrors. Why does this matter? Well, because a parabolic mirror, it's easy to test. All you do is allow light from a distant object to hit the mirror and see if you get a perfect focus. But hyperbolic mirrors don't work the same way. With the two mirrors in the Hubble Space Telescope, one is hyperbolic and the other is hyperbolic as well. One mirror doesn't produce sharp starlight. You need two mirrors. So how do you test a mirror if you need two of them to actually work correctly? That's part of the problem and part of the reason that the Hubble Space Telescope had issues. Only when they got it into orbit shortly after launch in 1990 did the horror slowly dawn on those that were testing it that something was seriously wrong. It would not focus. No matter what they did, they thought, have oh, we got to let it cool down a bit more now that it's sitting up there in space? Do we have to adjust the position of the secondary mirror? No, nope. no matter what they do, did, they could not get starlight to focus to a point. They had hoped to see schematically what you see on the left, nice sharp star points. What they got was something on the right. Most of the starlight was coming to a point, but outside that there was a halo of other light that looked like it was being scattered from something. And they were trying to work out what's going wrong. And after a while, they had to admit the main mirror has been made incorrectly. It's suffering from spherical aberration. This is an aberration that it simply should not have. Let's make sure we understand what spherical aberration is. Let's just imagine we are trying to focus light from a distant object. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's parabolic or hyperbolic. Let's just imagine it's a parabolic mirror, and we're trying to focus light from a, uh, an object at an infinite distance to the right-hand side. What happens is light hits the mirror and comes to a focus. Fine. And light hitting a slightly different part of the mirror, slightly outside those regions, should come to the focus at the same point but perhaps you can just notice they don't quite come to focus at the same point. But spherical aberration is such that the further out from the center of the mirror you go, the more the problem is evident. And if you go and hit the edges, you find the light doesn't come to anywhere near the same focus. So a parabolic mirror shouldn't suffer from this particular aberration. It's called spherical aberration because that's what you would expect if this surface was the shape of a sphere or a circle if you slice it through. So you wouldn't expect a parabola from suf to suffer from that and you wouldn't expect a hyperbola to suffer from that either. So if that's what you've actually got, light hitting different parts of the mirror will come to a focus at different points, where do you put your detector? Where do you put your CCD chip or your spectrometer? If you put it in the middle, you're not really at the focus of anywhere. If you put it where most of the light is focused, and most of the light hitting the center of the mirror would be focused where that black line is coming to a focus, but you can see that if you're there, any light hitting the edge of the mirror is going to come to a focus before the CCD chip, and you're going to end up with a halo. 
you're going to end up with most of the light focused to a point, but maybe 5 or 10% of the light hitting the outer part of the mirror is going to come to a focus too soon and will end up producing a defocused halo of light around each star. That's what they saw, and that's what they concluded was the problem. It's got spherical aberration, meaning the surface is too close to a sphere and isn't at all close to the shape it should be for giving pinpoint star images. So that's, remember, what they were hoping for, nice pinpoints with no halos. The middle is what they actually got. And just for comparison, what would you expect this telescope to produce if you brought it back down to Earth and looked at stars through the Earth's atmosphere? That's going to degrade the image. What sort of resolution would you expect if you had the same size telescope with perfect optics sitting on the ground? And that's the top image. So yes, they are doing better than the same telescope on the ground. But the bottom is what that telescope should be producing in terms of resolution. It's all very well saying, well, it's actually better than if it was on the ground. Correct. But you've just spent two and a half billion dollars putting it into orbit. I don't think taxpayers would be too happy saying, well, it's a little bit better than if we simply left it on the ground. So the mirror was made incorrectly. How could such a terrible mistake have been made? The problem stems from the fact it's not an easy thing to test. Perkin Elmer said, the mirror's fantastic. It's the most precisely figured mirror ever, ever made. A surface roughness of 10 nanometers. In other words, the mountains and valleys, the bumps that you see on the curve of the mirror, the roughness of the mirror, is about 10 nanometers. And it's difficult to figure out what the hell 10 nanometers means on something that's 2.5 meters in diameter. So, scale up the mirror until it's the size of the Earth. Take the mirror that they made, scale it up until it's the size of the Earth. Those bumps are now about 3 centimeters, mountain to valley, mountain to valley, 3 centimeters on something the size of the Earth. You can see that is a very, very smooth surface. However, it is very precisely the wrong shape. Yes, it was extremely smooth. They had tested it and made sure that it was very smooth. But it was very smooth on a figure that was wrong. It was not the correct shape. It was actually off by about two microns. The wavelength of light is about half a micron, so it's wrong by about four wavelengths of light. You may have a telescope in which the mirror is figured to half the wavelength of light, or a quarter of the wavelength of light, or a tenth of the wavelength of light. This was wrong by four wavelengths. It is so such a large error, it should have been absolutely obvious. So how come they didn't detect the problem? We're down to how do you do the test? If the mirror itself doesn't focus starlight to a point, a parabola will do that, a hyperbola won't. You can't grind and polish two mirrors and test them simultaneously. You basically have to grind one and test it. But how do you do that? You essentially fool the test system into thinking it's dealing with a parabola. You put in a so-called null corrector. It's an extra bit of optics. We don't have to worry about what it looks like. Just think of it as an extra pair of glasses that's put into the test system so that it makes the hyperbola look like a parabola, and then you can test if it, uh, if it then focuses starlight correctly. So a so-called null corrector was used as part of the test rig that Perkin Elmer used to test the mirror. But the null corrector, one of the elements of the null corrector, one of the lenses was put in slightly the wrong position. It was only off by a millimeter or so because a washer had been put on a bolt that shouldn't have been put on a bolt, so it pushed it out of the way. They should have seen that, but they thought they were looking at the right distance because they had a laser interferometer to test the distance, but they hadn't realized that the laser wasn't bouncing off the mirror they thought. It was bouncing off the fact that a little bit of uh, the jig, a little bit of the test rig, had black paint which had just peeled off to, relieve, to reveal a little bit of reflective aluminium, and they were picking up a reflection from that. So they weren't genuinely working out where these elements of the null corrector were. 
So they used a test rig where the test rig was set up incorrectly. And hence, any test you do that says this is the figure we want, if the test rig is wrong, then the shape of the mirror is wrong. Oh. And they didn't realize that, and hence they declared our test shows that it is a perfect mirror. They didn't realize until afterwards that the test rig was wrong. And arguably, a simpler test would have revealed the problem, but Perkin Elmer said, no need. We've got a really sophisticated sophisticated test rig, we've got a laser checking everything, and everything is okie dokie. There's no need to do a simple test which would have cost $10,000 or so. Save your money, we know it's okay. Basically that was the bottom line. The backup mirror is probably fine. Kodak made it and tested it completely independently of Perkin Elmer. There's no indication they made the same error. So the Kodak mirror is probably perfect. And it's sitting in a museum. And Perkin Elmer's mirror is now in orbit in the, in the space telescope. What do you do about the problem? How do you save Hubble? Well, the one thing that saved Hubble was that they had designed it from the outside to be serviceable by astronauts. The intention was, in a few years, you start to swap out instruments or upgrade cameras or upgrade spectrometers. They never actually envisaged they would need to service the mirror. So what do you do? Do you um, send the shuttle up, uh, catch the Hubble, put it back in the shuttle uh, uh, cargo bay, bring it back to Earth, and then swap the mirrors over and send it back up again? Well, that was seriously thought of as a possibility. That was an option, but that was considered to be a very dangerous option, bringing it back through the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, would it survive all of the vibration and the, the heat that, uh, that is generated? But the final solution they came up with was a little bit of a combination of, of luck and ingenuity, and that was they had a spare camera. Nothing to do with the mirror, they had a spare camera. This is not unusual when you have any sort of a mission, whether it be something in Earth orbit or sending Voyager to the other side of the solar system. It is quite common to have a flight model and a non-flight model of the same thing which is basically a duplicate sitting on the ground so that if things go wrong, you test it on the ground to see what's going on. You try out things on the ground. It's a bit like having a simulator, if you like. So they had a fully working spare camera. And they realized that, going back to Perkin Elmer, we know how the test rig was wrong. We know that that was misplaced by exactly this much. And therefore, we know that the figure of the mirror is wrong but we know precisely how wrong it is. We know to within a few nanometers what the true figure is, and we know what it should be, so we know what the problem is. In other words, we know exactly what the prescription is that's necessary to fix the problem by giving it glasses, if you like, if you want to think of it that way. So if you've got a camera on the ground, what you could do is modify the camera and add some extra optics before the light, which comes in here, into the camera. Before the light goes into the camera, you can add some optics which will just exactly correct for what you know the aberration of the mirror is. Because you know exactly what it is, you can effectively compensate for it. So, you take the mirror that's on the ground, you figure out what needs to be done, you, sorry, you take the camera on the ground, you figure out what needs to be done, and then you can, in principle, take that camera up and swap out the existing camera with that camera. That fixes one problem. It fixes one instrument. But the Hubble Space Telescope is not one camera. It's a whole set of cameras. It's two or three cameras and two or three spectrometers. So what they needed not only was to fix the camera, they needed, ideally, to fix all the instruments. They can't swap them all out in one go. That's totally impractical. But what they decided was, let's make ourselves a set of correct, corrective optics. It's a little bit difficult to see what that is. So there's a simplified version of it on the right, sitting in a museum. It's effectively a lot of mirrors on arms. And if that's placed in the right place, then basically an arm can come out and put a mirror into the light path such that the light from the telescope bounces off one of these mirrors before it goes to the relevant instrument. And there's various mirrors because you've got various instruments. And if you make these things correct and put them in the right place, and as long as these arms move correctly when commanded to do so, 
And as long as you make these mirrors not flat, but slightly curved to correct for the known problems in the mirror, then you should be able to send the mirror to the various instruments and they should then have their vision restored, if you like. So this idea of corrective optics is what they decided to do. A Swiss Army knife of corrective mirrors that would fix all the problems other than the camera problem, which will have its own set of optics built into it to make sure that it can see clearly. So we ought to remind ourselves exactly what the Hubble telescope looks like. Although we think of it as just a fantastic camera, there's at least, at any given time, there's at least two cameras and two spectrographs on board they've been confusingly swapped and upgraded so you know what they started with in 1990 is not what we have now in uh, 2020 but if we have a look at what's actually in there one way of thinking of the um, let me just give you an idea of the size of the camera for instance the uh, the chip in the camera the chip in the imaging camera is perhaps not as big as you think uh, that's it. Something like four by four centimeters is the size of the image in the Hubble Space Telescope. Some of you might have cameras with a bigger chip than that. It's about 16 megapixels. And again, probably some of you might have cameras with more than 16 megapixels on board. So it's not as if the camera is a huge device in terms of the chip. There's a lot going on other than the chip itself. But what makes the Hubble amazing is the fact that it's at the end of a very long focal length. So regardless of whether you call it wide angle or high resolution, that's just a question of, uh, of changing some of the optics on the way between the mirror and the instrument. The nominal focal length of the Hubble Space Telescope is 58 meters. And if you imagine how much sky do you see, well, imagine holding that up at a distance of 58 meters. If somebody were to walk away and hold it in the air at 58 meters distance, that's how much sky you would see using a chip that size. So a focal length of 58 meters is what allows the Hubble Space Telescope to get such exquisite detail in all the various pictures that you've seen. Let's just blow that up a little bit so we can see what's going on. Notice that the Hubble Space Telescope is mainly not a telescope. The front 25% is just lens hood. There's the secondary mirror, and there's the primary mirror. So the optics only occupy the central 40% or so of the Hubble Space Telescope, and virtually everything behind the main mirror is part of the instrumentation. One camera or another camera or one spectrograph or another spectrograph. And then it has other things like gyros to make sure it can point stably at a particular point in the distance. So we're not going to worry too much about what the instruments are. They've all got weird sounding uh, names and acronyms. We're not going to worry too much about that. But just to point out that although we think of cameras as being the main uh, instrument of choice in the Hubble Space Telescope, arguably, scientifically, that's actually less relevant than the fact that there are spectrometers on board, spectrographs. Um, a star might produce a relatively boring looking spectrum. In other words, how much light do we get as a function of wavelength or a function of color, if you prefer. But if the light from the star is exciting other elements around the star, then we will see the spectrum from the star and we might see characteristic lines of uh, bright lines in the spectrum. If the light from the star is going through some other interstellar medium before it gets to us at Earth, then we might see some of the light being taken out, in other words, being absorbed by whatever is between us and that distant star. And we can not only identify from the positions or the colors, if you like, of where these bright or dark lines are, not only will that tell us what particular elements are present, if we look at where they are relative to where we see them in laboratory-based sources, if we find they've moved, that tells us that that object, that star or that galaxy, is moving towards us or moving away from us through a phenomena called Doppler shifting. So we get an enormous amount of information by looking at the spectrum. And in effect, we find out what it's made of and what it's doing, how it's moving. A photograph, an image, just tells us what it looks like. A spectrum tells us what it is, what it's made of, and what it's doing. Far more information. But it is equally important to get images and spectra from various objects. 
Let's have a quick look. This is a rather confusing slide, so I'll just take a minute to explain what's going on here. This is how things have changed during the service missions from the original launch in 1990 on the left up to where we are now, 2020, on the right. I'm not going to go through the details of what these various instruments are. A rough rule of thumb, if you've got an acronym that ends in an S, it's probably a spectrometer. If you've got an acronym that ends in a C, it's probably a camera. That's all you need to know. It doesn't really matter about the details. In addition, we have gyros and electrical systems. Gyros have to be serviced every once in a while. Electrical systems have to be serviced every once in a while. The first thing that happened after all the problems were seen when it first launched was, well, we've got a camera, WFC. It, it actually stands for wide, wide field camera, but it doesn't matter. Camera number one is there, but we have got camera number two on the ground. We're going to fix camera number two, and we're going to put it in place of camera number one. So we're going to change camera one to camera two. We now have a working imaging system. If we want to get the Swiss Army Knife CoStar, the corrective optics with the various arms and the various mirrors, which is going to correct the light to all the other instruments, it needs physical space to put that in. We're going to have to sacrifice one other instrument. This one was considered the, uh, the, the, the least important. It's a photometer. It would be measuring the intensities of light from stars. That was sacrificed in order to get CoStar in. The Asterisk simply means they did a tune-up. They just did a tweak of the gyros to make sure they were all working. They did a tweak of the electronic systems to make sure that they were all working. And then they imaged using the new camera, and it worked. There was no pressure, but the astronauts were told, if you replace camera one with camera two, and the Hubble Space Telescope still doesn't work, that's not the end of the Hubble Space Telescope. That's probably the end of NASA. You, you can't go to Congress and ask for $2 billion, make a turkey, and then go back and ask for more money. So the astronauts knew that it was literally make or break. They put the camera in, they closed the doors, the scientists booted up the new camera, and it did what it was supposed to do. And CoStar did what it was supposed to do as well. And then they had a fully functioning system. So definite sigh of relief at that point. The, thought, the thought of a world with no NASA is a little scary as far as I'm concerned. So kudos to the astronauts who got it all to work, basically, and, of course, the engineers and the, uh, the optics people who designed CoStar. A few years later, they had another service mission in which they replaced uh, one of the spectrometers. Sorry, they replaced two of the spectrometers. Why do they replace spectrometers? Well, remember, this was designed in the 70s, built in the 80s. It's already old. As of the mid-1990s, the Hubble Space Telescope is already not state-of-the-art. It was built with 1980s technology, and by the mid-1990s, technology moves on, you can make them better, and therefore they decided to replace a couple of spectrometers with basically the newest models of spectrometers. So that's what they did in, uh, when was that, 1997 by the looks of it. Then another service mission just before 2000, they again tweaked the gyros, um, they had a little bit of a problem with this particular spectrometer. Just after um, they checked everything was okay, it seemed to start failing. The grey means something is going wrong with that particular spectrometer. So it is only really a little bit of a tune-up to make sure the gyros, which are responsible for making sure that the Hubble can point where it should be pointing and stay locked on to a target, that they were tuned up, but then they started having problems with the spectrometer. So the second part of that service mission was to fix the spectrometer, tune that up again, get it working, uh, have another tweak of the electronics and make sure the power systems are working correctly. But other than that, everything seemed to be good. They also took the opportunity of replacing this camera, ACS, um, they're just being rather um, nasty here. It looks like a spectrometer because there's an S on the end. Actually, it's a camera. It's advanced camera for surveys. So they're replacing one camera with an upgrade for that camera. Again, because we are now more than 10 years into the mission, that camera is more than 15 years old. They simply replace the camera. At that point, they'd had four missions, and Congress said, well, you know, this is really expensive servicing the Hubble. We can see the need to do it. You've got CoStar and the cameras there and everything is now looking good, but you, you know, do you really need another service mission? 
scientists shouted, yes, we definitely need one more to try and get it absolutely ticking over perfectly such that with no more missions it will hopefully last as long as possible because remember the shuttle was going to be decommissioned there won't be any further missions after the last uh, after the last uh, shuttle service mission so there were things going wrong uh, electronics was getting a little bit dodgy uh, this spectrometer failed uh, this camera failed and so Rather than say, well, half the things are still working, we're okay, we're good for a few more years, they said, give us one more service mission to fix everything, and then we're good to go. So basically, in 2009, they had the final service mission. They replaced camera two with camera three. Again, technology marches on. The uh, original, the original uh, chips weren't quite the high resolution. They were slightly smaller than this one, a lower number of megapixels. Um, the camera 3 ended up with 4x4 four four centimeters in size and 16 million pixels in the images. Every spectrometer, every camera has now been swapped out. In the previous service missions, whichever one it was, none of the original cameras or spectrometers are now there. They've all been replaced with new cameras or spectrometers which have got their own optics to make sure that they correct for the errors in the main mirror. So the Swiss Army knife is no longer required. The co-star can now come out. That's why it's in a museum. It's not a mock-up. It's the real thing because co-star did come back with the astronauts when they removed it to make room for one more spectrometer. Spectrometers are so important, they decided that we could do with a third one. So they've got the best camera. They've replaced the spectrometer. They tweak the gyros, tweak the electronics, make sure that spectrometer's working, make sure that spectrometer's working, make sure that camera's working. As of 2010, they had a fully operational Hubble Space Telescope. I am not aware of any major problems since then. So the philosophy of let's get everything right and hope it lasts for a while seems to have been validated. But you can see it had a very checkered history for the first 20 years of its life. It was continuously, almost continuously, being upgraded and tweaked and getting uh, the best you can possibly get by replacing the technology, replacing the instrumentation with the latest that could be obtained. And I hope that if we do go beyond 2020, we don't start entering any more grey bars of things failing and uh, instruments starting to stop working. So that's how the Hubble Space Telescope came to be where it is today, effectively. How has it extended our understanding of the universe? Well, as I said, the examples are just too many, so I will just pick out a few about distant scales, exoplanets, um, something about galaxies and supernova. Well, I won't have time to do any of them uh, full justice, as it were. One of the first things that Hubble did when it went up is had a look at stars in the Andromeda galaxy. This is the outer part of the Andromeda galaxy. Some of these stars might be foreground stars in our Milky Way, but a lot of the fainter stars are actually in the Milky Way themselves. If you look for Cepheid stars, these are stars whose luminosity varies, which is something you can easily um, measure just by um, taking pictures at different times and seeing how the intensity varies. The period of the luminosity variation, it's known to be related to the luminosity of the star, the absolute luminosity of the star. We know that by looking at stars in our own galaxy. So if you can look at stars and look at their luminous variations, if that gives you the absolute luminosity and you know how faint they look, then you know how far away they are. Because if you know how bright they are and you know how bright they look, it tells you the distance. So we can now tell the distance to the Andromeda galaxy thanks to Hubble looking in detail at some of the fainter stars in the galaxy. And that led to a slight readjustment of how big we think the universe is, because if Andromeda, one of our nearest neighbors, is actually a little bit further away than we thought, it sort of got modified from something like 2.2 million to 2.5 million, that meant the entire universe ended up getting a little bit bigger than we thought. And that matters on a cosmic scale in terms of our understanding of how the universe came to be. Exoplanets these days, in the, in the 2010s and 2020s, uh, we're used to the idea of there are lots of exoplanet discoveries. But back in the, when was this? In the early 2000s, uh, 10 years or so after Hubble was put up, it actually was the first telescope to actually be able to image 
um, planets going around another star. Here's a star. It looks a bit odd. There's a lot of scattered light, and most of the star has been removed. There's just a dot there telling you where the star was before it's been removed. All of this is just scattered light from the very bright star in the center compared to the very faint planets which are in this little box and then blown up in the, inter in the inset there in the bottom right. So Hubble was able to image and show that that particular point moves between 2004 and 2006, indicating that it was actually imaging a planet going around this star. Yes, since then, plenty of other systems have actually shown us that we're not just able to image individual stars, but we're able to identify exoplanets around thousands of different solar systems. But we haven't imaged planets around other solar systems. We've only inferred their existence from looking at how the stars wobble in their position or how the star's intensity changes when a planet moves in front of them. Hubble showed that you can actually image individual exoplanets. Not only that, but Hubble was actually able to take spectra as well. And if you look at the change in spectrum when a planet goes in front of a star, some of the light travels through the atmosphere of the planet. You can say something about what elements must exist or what compounds or what molecules must exist in the atmosphere of a planet as it passes in front of a star. And Hubble was able to look at the abundance of water in various exoplanets. Still a very tricky thing to do with any other telescope other than the Hubble Space Telescope. Of course, it's been able to image, I don't know, countless thousands of individual galaxies. Here's a beautiful spiral gal galaxy seen face on. And uh, some galaxies have got rather unusual structure. Um, understanding how this galaxy came to be, it's almost like a spiral arm, except the spiral arm doesn't join the inside to the out like a Catherine wheel. It seems to be one loop or one ring of a, of a galaxy. So again, understanding galaxy formation by looking in detail at as many galaxies as possible is Hubble's forte. This, I thought, was a quite remarkable uh, image. Um, it's uh, showing uh, a galaxy with apparently four supernova going off in it, four yellow dots. But you know that uh, supernova don't happen very often. In our galaxy, we haven't had one for 400 years. How can they have four all going off at the same time? That's not fair. Um, it was realized at the time that what we're actually seeing is gravitational lensing. We're seeing a very distant galaxy. It doesn't matter which one we look at. But a very distant galaxy on the right. And because of a, a supercluster of galaxies in between our line of sight from that distant galaxy to us, light is being bent and taking various paths. So some of the light is that galaxy we see, but there are other ghost images of that galaxy a little bit further away. Not only that, but there appears to be a galaxy right on the center line of that distant galaxy to us, and that is imaging a single supernova in the distant galaxy. Whoops. It's imaging it and causing four, if you like, ghost images, four images of the same supernova within that galaxy. So that galaxy is actually the same as the one uh, that's a little bit up to the left, top and left, and also much further up top and left. Those are actually the same galaxy as well. So not only has it been determined that, yes, the, uh, the matter, and probably the dark matter in this cluster, is causing the light to take different routes between the galaxy and the Hubble Space Telescope, not only can we see that we've got four supernovae there, but it's also been determined by the theorists who worked out why you get these distortions produced by the matter and dark matter in the cluster. It's been determined that some light is coming via this rather circuitous dogleg route, as we can see in the top, which means that galaxy there, we're seeing that a little bit older. The light is taking slightly longer to reach us. It might have taken a billion years to get here, but one route takes a few years more than the other route because they're taking slightly different paths, and the speed of light is always the same. It can't go faster and slower. So if one route is longer, it's going to take longer for light to arrive. So here we see four supernova. It was determined by the theorists that because light is taking longer to reach us for this image, if we stare at that galaxy or come back to it in six months' time, we will see a supernova go off. That was one of the few times they've ever been able to say, because of the way this lensing is working, because of the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope, they were able to say, with this particular setup, 
if we come back in six or seven or eight months after the original observation, we've calculated that light will have had time to reach us via this second route, and we will see a supernova go off. They went back seven months later, a supernova went off. So they did indeed catch a supernova. Usually you only catch them after they've gone off. In this particular case, they caught it right from the outset as long as they went back and started taking images at a regular intervals when they thought it was due and it hit pretty much the mark that the theorists had predicted. That wouldn't have been possible without the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope imaging four separate supernova via that particular mechanism. The Hubble Deep Field is, I think, well known as look into the sky where you think there's nothing and see what's there. They had to fight to actually get Hubble time to take that picture because most people were saying, no, we image the things that we know are there. Whereas some brave soul said, no, why don't we just look at nothing and see what's out there? And eventually they got permission to spend 10 days exposing um, basically what they thought was going to be nothing. In this particular case, there's, um, I think, two two stars in this image, and everything else are galaxies. Every other dot in the image is a distant galaxy. So we're looking a long way back in time by looking a long way deep into space, many billions of light years. And that changed our understanding of exactly how many galaxies there are in the universe. To give you an idea of the size of the Hubble Deep Field, that's basically if we think about that sort, of, uh, that sort of chip size, how much sky is it imaging? That's how much sky it is imaging compared to the full moon. It gives you an idea of the field of view. Obviously tiny compared to uh, uh, most amateur uh, telescope systems. And just to prove it wasn't a fluke, they took another one, uh, one in the northern hemisphere, one in the southern hemisphere, to confirm that the universe looks pretty much the same in all directions. There's nothing special about the one they happened to choose in the first place. And by imaging lots of these uh, clusters and superclusters, the Hubble Space Telescope allowed us to get a handle on how much dark matter is out there, mainly through this idea of the bending of light, the so-called gravitational lensing, which produces a distortion of the uh, of galaxies behind these various superclusters that we can see. So I said I was going to cover scientific legacy as well as touching the public consciousness. A couple of very nice quotes I saw in uh, Astronomer magazine. They talk about the Hubble Space Telescope elucidating the laws of physics created these incredible structures such as the pillars of creation, things like that, and Hubble has revealed them. Through all the research, Hubble has brought the public along for the ride. It's taken the, the, the excitement that scientists feel with new discoveries and brought it to non-scientists. And that is one of the legacies of the Hubble Space Telescope, more so than any other scientific instrument, more so than the Large Hadron Collider, which also cost billions and has been producing various aspects of um, advancing our scientific understanding, but the Hubble Space Telescope has brought the public along for the ride. That is the difference. So let's just take a few minutes and let's indulge ourselves to a few of the images that the Hubble Space Telescope has produced over the years. This is really just a slideshow of some of my favorites. The Helix Nebula, visible in Aquarius, low down in the south, from England. It's huge, it's a, it's a fraction of the size of the full moon, um, but not particularly bright. And because it's so huge, um, Hubble had to take this as a mosaic, it couldn't fit it in in one image. But one of the things that Hubble has been doing has been looking at galaxies and galaxies in collision. Here's two galaxies colliding, the so-called antenna galaxies, and uh, whenever you get galaxies colliding with each other, you tend to get a lot of pink indicating that you've got a lot of star formation. So although it might sound dramatic, actually galaxy collisions is one way of promoting the birth of new stars. Perhaps you recognize the Crab Nebula, imaged many times before the Hubble, but the Hubble managed to produce some amazing resolution within the structure of the supernova remnant. I thought this was a very nice galaxy. It's almost edge on. 
and again it shows you from the pink that you see embedded in here as well as the dust that you see around the equator of the uh, of the spiral galaxy you see all the pink indicating where the star formation regions are if you study hundreds or thousands of galaxies you get a good indication of how galaxies evolve mystic mountain this is a structure within the eta carina or carine uh, nebula a bit like the pillars of creation in the eagle nebula this is a different nebula but shows similar structures you get these clouds that have been sculpted by the very high stellar winds on some of the young stars that are embedded inside these cloud structures one of my favorite galaxies even before the Hubble came along was M104 the sombrero galaxy a beautiful combination of a large halo and a very distinct dust ring around the equator the glob globular cluster M5 this is a reminder that a lot of telescopes have problems resolving individual stars especially when you get close to the center of a globular cluster and the best they can do is look at stars away from the core Hubble Space Telescope with its fantastic resolution is able to image individual stars from the outer edge all the way to a core of a globular cluster our Milky Way galaxy is a barred spiral it hasn't got a bar anywhere near this big this is a spectacular barred spiral in which the bar seems to be almost as long as the individual spiral arms in the case of the Milky Way the bar in the middle of the galaxy is a little bit shorter but still a rather spectacular structure to image and in some cases imaging galaxies tells us about evolution and structure and in some cases the images that Hubble produced are simply beautiful images the pillars of creation were imaged early on in Hubble's history and then re-imaged 25 years later with the new third generation camera with the higher resolution and that uh, if you've ever seen the original pillars of creation and then the anniversary edition you'll see the improvements in technology the improvements in resolution but still of course a spectacular image as much in the 90s as it was in the in the teenies and again the Hubble deep field and ultra deep field have really changed the way we think about the structure of the universe and just how many galaxies are out there and how the galaxies as we look back in time billions or more than 10 billion years how we um, understand the structure of the universe by this look back in such a deep field so that's just a few pictures to remind us how the public comes along and can engage with this by astronomy picture of the day or Hubble Heritage web page by looking at images like that even if people don't understand all of the science they're still in awe at the various images that are produced so let me finish by asking the question what lies beyond Hubble why can't we just use ground-based telescopes um, maybe you've heard that there are ways of using so-called adaptive optics you have um, a turbulent atmosphere but if you shine a laser into the atmosphere you generate effectively an artificial star if you look at how that laser is wobbling you get an idea of how the earth's atmosphere is changing and moving and if you're fast enough you might be able to change the mirror not usually the primary mirror but maybe the secondary mirror maybe you can change the optics to compensate for the fact that you can see the star wobbling you can see the f artificial star wobbling in other words shine a laser in the sky and then do whatever it takes to keep that artificial star as steady as possible and that hopefully will compensate for the fact that the earth's atmosphere is jiggling around and degrading your images so if you can do that why bother with a space telescope at all so if you can do that with any of these telescopes including if you could do it with a 40 meter telescope why on earth would you bother with any space telescope that isn't even comparable in size well there is a, a limit to what you can do with adaptive optics or active active optics and that is you can only get a high resolution over a limited field of view 
Yes, you can send a laser up and you can see what the atmosphere is doing here and compensate for it, sure. But the atmosphere over here is doing something different. And the atmosphere over here is doing something different. So if you wanted to keep your image sharp over the entire field of view, depending on how big your chip is, you can do it for a few pixels close to the center. Great for imaging an exoplanet. But if you wanted to keep all 16 million pixels as sharp as they could be, you can't afford to have a turbulent atmosphere. Even if you've got adaptive optics, there's a limit to what you can do. You're still better off with a space telescope. So if you want sharp images across the entire field of view of whatever your chip or spectrometer is dealing with, you need to get above the atmosphere. You can compensate to some extent using technology for telescopes on the ground, but it's not as good. There are other telescopes in orbit. Let me just briefly say something. I won't say too much about Kepler. Kepler's now switched off. Kepler had a mission to look for um, Earth-like planets uh, orbiting other stars. It did that by having a relatively large chip, nothing as small as 4 by 4 centimeters. You can see that its detector was substantially larger, getting onto the size of a coffee table. Um, and that allowed it to stare at a particular patch of sky. It didn't survey the whole sky. It just looked at stars in a particular field of view there around Cygnus and Lyra. And then it looked at the intensities and looked for dips that are characteristic of exoplanets going in front of those stars. Also, Gaia has been up for a few years and producing wonderful data. Gaia's uh, aim was to measure the positions as accurately as possible of not just a few million stars, but something of order a billion stars, and measure their positions accurate to not an arc second, not a milli arc second, but to an accuracy of order 25 micro arc seconds, 25 millionths of an arc second. And that's a phenomenal accuracy, which you can only get by having these things, again, outside the Earth's atmosphere. It was also going to do some spectral measurements and some um, intensity measurements, some photometric measurements. The idea was to measure where the stars are in the Milky Way and how they're moving. It gives us a much better idea of the dynamics of all the stars in the Milky Way. Some of that data is already released, and some of it's already producing some very interesting results. Not least, we've now got a better 3D model of the Milky Way. One of the interesting things they did was to look at all the stars that you can see within a certain distance. We know that we're some distance from the center. Let's say about 30,000 light years or whatever. They basically said, let's take all the stars that Gaia is looking at and let's remove all the stars within 70,000 light years. Those are the ones in the main bulk of the Milky Way. When they did that, lo and behold, they found a faint galaxy on the other side of the Milky Way, which has been there all the time, but we just weren't aware of it until we had the capabilities of Gaia to be able to map out where all these stars are. So we've got a small Magellanic Cloud, a large Mag Magellanic Cloud, and a much bigger dwarf galaxy sitting just on the other side of the Milky Way, just where it's very difficult to see because the core of the Milky Way is in the way. But Gaia managed to see it. An amazing result. How does it achieve that sort of precision? Well, a bit like um, Kepler, it achieves it with large detectors. In this case, it is something like a coffee table. It's a huge, great thing. A whole set of multiple CCD detectors. It's got a very modest sized mirror like Kepler, but if you get your instrumentation right, you can do amazing things. Where do we go beyond Hubble? Let's just reflect on Hubble. OK, there's a pun for you. There's an astronaut with uh, Hubble reflected in his visor. Is there a successor waiting in the wings? Well, I'm sure you've heard of the James Webb Space Telescope. This is going to be a telescope that works in the infrared. It's going to have a segmented mirror rather than a solid mirror like the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And it's going to be working in the infrared, so it needs shields to make sure that we don't get infrared radiation from any pesky neighbors like the moon or the Earth or the sun. It's large compared to the Hubble. There's the 2.4 meter diameter Hubble compared to a standard person. And there's the something like 6 meter diameter primary of the James Webb. In order to get it into orbit, it's going to have to go on the top of a rocket. And you can't get a 6 meter diameter mirror into a rocket, so it has to be folded. It'll go up, and then the mirror will unfold, and the segments will move until they make that particular pattern. But James Webb is going to end up there. It's not going to orbit the Earth. It's going to go to one of these so-called Lagrange points called L2. It's about a million miles from Earth. 
um, Gaia's there at the moment. That doesn't necessarily mean it has to nudge Gaia out the way. Plenty of room over there. But it's about a million miles away from the Earth, and it's at one of these so-called Lagrange points, which are stable points at which you can park a spacecraft. In other words, if you go to these points and stop, that spacecraft will stay there. So it's a rather unusual result, but that is far enough away from the Earth and the Moon and the Sun such that it should be able to deploy its shields and block out the infrared light coming from those rather hot objects. The Sun very hot, but the Earth and the Moon also radiating infrared, which you don't want to spoil your images. Why is it looking into the infrared? And how is it going to be different from the Hubble Space Telescope when it eventually launches in a year or two or three or four, whenever they finally get it into orbit. If we look at the pillars of creation, remember this is uh, a whole load of gas and dust and stars are sculpting these clouds because stars are embedded inside these things and producing very high winds, which is, uh, which is uh, evaporating some of the uh, material and sculpting these shapes. But, of course, these are almost opaque in the sense that we can hardly see anything through them. They're blocking all the light that's behind these structures. But infrared is less sensitive to that, and if we look in the infrared, they become almost transparent, and we see through all the gas and the dust, and we see what's actually going on inside or on the other side. And this would be useful not only to look inside these star-forming regions, but also when a planetary system is starting to form. When a solar system is in its youngest days, there's an awful lot of gas and dust around, and it's very difficult to see planets starting to form. But if we use infrared, we can start to see not only solar systems that are very mature and already existing, we can start to look at young solar systems and start to see how they are starting to form so we can get a much better idea of planetary origins. Not only that, but if we think of very distant galaxies, the average um, color of most galaxies is somewhere in the middle of the visible spectrum. In other words, it tends not to be in the infrared and not to be in the ultraviolet. Most stars in most galaxies emit, like our sun, somewhere in the visible spectrum. But the most distant galaxies are moving away from us so fast their light is shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. So although the galaxies are producing visible light, the very distant galaxies have got most of their light shifted into the infrared part of the spectrum. So if we were to look with something like a Hubble Deep Field, but use infrared light, we would be able to see those galaxies brighter, or we would be able to see similar galaxies at a greater distance. So in other words, we'll be able to push back and go even deeper Mm. even deeper than the Hubble Deep Field if we use the James Webb. So there are a number of reasons why we want to switch from visible imaging to infrared imaging, and that's why the James Webb is waiting in the wings and hopefully will be going up soon. That doesn't mean the Hubble hasn't got a few years of life left in it. Hopefully there will be overlap. Hopefully the Hubble will continue to work for a few years whilst the James Webb goes up and starts doing its thing. So... I've given you a, an indication of why we need a space telescope and the ground-based alternatives. I gave you a little bit of history of how they got the mirror wrong and what they did about how, how to fix the corrective optics and the new cameras, etc. And then I said a little bit about how, just a very little bit, about how it's improved our understanding of the universe and how the public has come along for the ride. And the future, there will always be a need for space telescopes. James Webb is the next but there will, I'm sure, be space telescopes well into the future. Thank you all for listening.